In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Saint Francis Xavier, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. All right, so. Just to, to recap what we talked about this morning in terms of uh, God's mercy. You know, the, in, in the Old Testament, we have David saying, my sins are always before me. My sins are always before me. Now, that really should be a reality in our lives. However, we shouldn't be burdened by that. I know David maintained his trust in the Lord and was not burdened by his sins. Readily accepted reparation. So we want our sins to always be before us without being burdened by them. They, it, they should just be a constant reminder of our need for Christ's mercy. We cannot live without His mercy. And, and once we understand how merciful He is and give ourselves over to His mercy, it's very free. Again, not to the point of presumption, I can just go out and sin because our Lord's gonna is going to uh, uh, forgive me if I sin, but but it, it frees us up to be as passionate as possible for our Lord. And again, I, I just want to reiterate this: is why I love Saint Peter. You know. Uh, all right. So uh, so. We, we don't want to be like the, the older son, all right, you know, the, 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 the older son of the merciful father. We don't ever want to intellectualize our sins, rationalize our sins. We don't ever want to think we're completely in the right, that we're completely justified. This is a pridefulness that will spell our doom. Uh, we want to maintain that humility. Uh, okay, maybe the other person was 99% wrong, uh, but that means I was 1% wrong. I need to deal with that, right? And even then, I've been wrong other times. I, I need to deal with that. Uh, this is the whole idea of just being conscious of the log in our eye. But the fallacy about this whole log splinter thing that the world wants us to fall into this trap is that... We, the log in our eye keeps us from confronting the other person about their sin. No, 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 no. All right, our Lord says, all right, take the log out of your eye so you can take the splinter out of their eye. And, and really, it's a log in our eye because our sins are before us. But we need to learn ways, merciful ways, that we can deal with people in terms of their sinfulness. And that comes about how? By recognizing that we're sinful too. You know, the, the best way of, of, of dealing with somebody else's sin that we love is, been there, done that. Maybe not exactly what you're doing, but I've been there. And our Lord will bless them. Fly unto the Blessed Virgin Mary, the models of the saints, uh, Again, contemplative life. If you're struggling in your apostolate, if you're struggling in your work life, if you're struggling in your family, it's all about your prayer life. It's all about your prayer life. What are you asking our Lord every day? Are you asking, Lord, show me more. Give me more wisdom. Lord, give me more strength. Help me do more. And again, understanding how we're really going to be judged. What is Jesus really going to judge us on? And as much as you're dealing with these distractive issues, don't let them distract you from your personal sanctification, your, per your personal holiness. Don't let them distract you from what you know is on the final exam for you. All right?
Again, the contemplative life, ponder all things in your heart. Again, what, the Blessed Mother had a special grace, a particular grace that kept her from sinning. But from a human standpoint, it makes perfect sense that she pondered everything in her life. Why do we, we, we sin impulsively? Because we don't ponder, we react. Somebody says something, we react. We hear something, we react. And then all of a sudden, uh, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Well, because you didn't ponder. Right? The more we think, the more we say, I, I don't have to say anything. I don't have to do anything. I can let it go. Right? And then the whole idea of humble, humble obedience and, and objectively speaking. All right, let's talk about purgatory and reparation. I was talking at lunch with Father, and, and you know, this all came about years ago. I think I was in the seminary, and the theological question came up, in my mind at least, you know, how does an all-just, all-loving, all-merciful, all-knowing God create someone, put them into his plan of salvation, knowing that they're going to choose him? Right? How can you be all-just, all-merciful, all-knowing? Create someone and say, Thomas said, don't say, oh, well, free choice, you know, freedom of choice, you know, freedom of choice. Right? Free will, free will, free will. That's the, the answer I get. I'm sorry, it doesn't suffice. It doesn't answer the question. As an all-just, all-loving, all-merciful God, create someone and St. Thomas said, God knows. God knows. This whole idea of predestination, God knows. But St. Thomas says, we don't know, so why would you choose hell? Exactly. But this is the question. But this is an intellectual trap. That question is an intellectual trap that the evil one wants us to use to come up with the whole idea that there's no hell. That there's no hell. So as much as I can't get my mind around that question and can't figure that out, I know there's a hell. Why do I know there's a hell? Why do I know that? I'm at, I know and I'm convinced that there's a hell. Why? What? Who's got the answer? Because Jesus said there's hell. And he says it over and over and over and over again. And the fact is, the reason why you hear about hell so much in Scripture is because of that intellectual trap. He knows that in our human nature, we're going to figure out a way to convince ourselves that there's no hell. And that's exactly what the evil one wants. Now, conversely, why is purgatory never clearly stated, maybe not by name, but by some conceptual thing? Why didn't Jesus say, look, if there's a place where my justice meets his mercy, right? Why is that any place in Scripture? Well, basically, it's not, first of all, it is all over Scripture, and that's what we're going to do for the next hour. The day's ever. All right? And I'm not going to use any scripture verses. There's tons of scripture verses. First shall be last, and last shall be first. You know, you won't be released until you pay the last penny. I mean, you can go into an apologetics book and get all the scripture verses. We're going to talk about power, three powers, right? But the reason why it's not so clearly defined or delineated in scripture is because purgatory is the most rational doctrine of the church. It's just completely rational. There's no other way to explain how Christ can be all just and all merciful at the same time. There's no other way. Benedict said that. Right? Benedict said that it, it's so logical, it's so rational that, that if indeed purgatory did not exist, we'd have to come up with, with, with a purgatory. Right? And of course the church can. You know, the binding and loosing power of the church. You ever think about that? Did you ever think the binding and loosing power of the church? You know, Jesus didn't say to Peter, Peter, you know what? I'm going to give you the power, the wisdom, the grace to figure out what we're thinking and what the truth is in heaven so you can follow it on earth. Or Peter, I'm going to give you the wisdom and the grace to figure out what's not true and what we don't like in heaven so you can follow it on earth. No, that's not what Jesus said. He said, what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you set loose on, we're going to follow worldly. 
mean, that's how much power Jesus entrusted to his church. And he did it three times, three places. Matter of fact, you want to wow? You want to wow your Christian friends? Because you, none of you are Bible tokers. None of you, none of you, none of you read the Bible. None of you, right? Know the Bible. I mean, right? You want to blow your 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 Christian brothers and sisters, not Catholics, mind? There's three binding and loosing passages in the church. I mean, in, in scripture, three binding and loosing passages. And I'm going to give you a, a very simple way of how you can remember them, so you can blow the minds of your Christian brothers and sisters, not Catholic. Matthew chapter 16, the, the, basically the middle verse is 16, so it's Matthew 16, 16. And then Matthew 18, and basically the middle verse is Matthew 18, 18. That's when he gives it to all the bishops in conjunction with the Pope, right? So Matthew 16, 16 has to do with Peter. 18, 18 has to do with all the bishops in conjunction. You don't even have to write this down. You don't memorize this before you're done. And then the binding and loosing power in John is basically 19, 19. No, 2020. 2020. Right? Chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. Those are the three binding and loosing power passages in the Bible. Matthew 16, 16, 18, 18, John 20, 20. 16, 18, 20. 16, 16, 18, 18, 20, 20. Matthew, Matthew, John. So you tell your Christian brothers and sisters, well, Jesus gave binding and loosing power in the church three times in Scripture. Oh, yeah, where? Well, Matthew 16, 16, Matthew 18, 18, and John 20, 20. What? What? Are you Catholic? Are you Catholic? <laughs> right? I love you. All right. So we have this, we have this intellectual trap. Jesus understands it. Jesus understands his intellectual trap. So he talks over and over and over again about hell. And, uh, and then, of course, purgatory. He gives us plenty of teaching. And, of course, purgatory, again, with our Christian brothers and sisters equate purgatory with what? Hell. Right? They've convinced themselves since there's fire, pain, suffering, it must be hell. Because they don't understand this whole Catholic notion of redemptive suffering. They don't get it, they don't understand it, and they don't accept it. You always want to be happy, joyful, right? But of course we know, and this is what I tell my Christian brothers and sisters all the time. Every soul in purgatory is saved. That's important. Every soul in purgatory is saved, and they know they're saved. And this is also important. They have just not experienced the salvation yet. That's important. So they're saved. They know they're saved. But they're not experiencing that salvation. Because they're still being purgated. Right, in, in reparation for the sins right, that they committed right, in the prior generation. Right, the prior age. So that's important. Now this whole theological debate as to whether the souls in purgatory can actually pray for us with merit. I'm still contemplating that. I, I, when I was brought up, there was no souls in purgatory can't do anything other than suffer. There are now people saying that, that they can pray for us. I wouldn't bank on that. But we know that their primary way of moving through purgatory, apart from them enduring the suffering, is our praying their way through purgatory. And so we need to have a devotion for the souls in purgatory. Especially those that have no one to pray for them. I'm going to talk at the end of this about how you can easily, logically, practically say there's no... No one experiences salvation, actually experiences salvation outside the Catholic Church. So put that in your pocket, we'll come back to it. Alright? The souls in purgatory are saved, they know they're saved, 
and we need to pray their way through purgatory by our prayers, our masses, our works of mercy, right? Are uniting everything we do to Christ and the cross for the intentions of the poor souls in purgatory. Soul, I'm sorry, not the poor souls in purgatory because they're safe. Souls in purgatory, especially those that have no one to pray for them. All right? I, I equate the souls in purgatory as part of the least of Christ's brethren, the poor, the sick, the thirsty, the hungry, the, 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 the naked, right? I, I see this the same way. Then they become our friends. We help them through purgatory. They become our friends. And then they're going to help us. By right? this whole notion, our Christian brothers and sisters say, oh, well, well saints, uh, I mean, people die. They go to heaven. And that's it. And of course, that's crazy, right? Because there's nothing but love in heaven. So if they're not going to help us get to heaven, what do they say? Nah, 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 nah. I made it. You didn't. You know, you're not there yet. Well, we'll see if you make it. <laughs> right? I mean, that's crazy, right? It's crazy. Of course. The beauty, the richness of Catholicism is the, 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 the mystical body of Christ, the church militant, the church suffering, and, 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 and the church triumphant, all working together for our, all of our salvation, right? So we help each other get to heaven. The saints help us get to heaven. We help the souls in purgatory, they get to heaven, they help us get to heaven. It's like all of us trying to help each other, elevate each other to heaven. I mean, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's beautiful. All right. Two of my favorite stories, and again, if you read uh, St. Augustine's description of his mother's death, very poignant. And at the very end, uh, Monica is like, she's done. Augustine came to conversion. She's done. I have no reason to be here now. You're Catholic. That's it. Lord, take me. Right? And, and they're arguing. Him and his brother are arguing over whether they should go back to Africa, bury her in Africa or Rome or whatever. And she says, that's nonsense. <laughs> bury me wherever you want. I only have one request. This is St. Monica. I only have one request. Just remember me any time you're at the altar of the Lord. In other words, when you celebrate Mass, remember me. Well, if purgatory is good enough for Monica, it's good enough for me. But my favorite purgatory story is St. Bernadette. She's another one of my favorite saints, St. Bernadette, right? Uh, and there's the story of either a bishop or a cardinal, I think it was from Belgium or whatever, many of may know the story, and he was a doubter. He doubted Lourdes. He couldn't understand how she would leave Lourdes, if indeed Lourdes was legit, why she would leave. Well, she left because she knew it would be a big temptation. She knew, right, that people were going to come from all over the world, and it would be what it is. And of course, you can see the temptations of Lourdes now. You have the holy place, and then you have the commercials, right? Uh, and she knew that. And she was actually ostracized from her brother and parts of her family because they got into that commercialism, so she left her to bear, right? So this bishop demanded to see her. And, uh, and the mother said, no, you can't see her, you can't see her, you can't see her. But finally, they asked Bernadette and Bernadette said, I'll see her. And uh, he sits down with Bernadette and he says, I'm telling you right now, I don't believe in you. I don't believe in the Lord. I think you're a fraud. I think you're a fake, right, etc." And she said, well, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, right? I think that might have been the conversation where she said, look, it's not my job to convince you. It's just my job to inform, right? That's it, right? But he says, well, I don't believe you. So he asked at one point, he says to her, do you think you're a saint? That's what he asked. This is Bernadette's answer. She goes, you know, Bishop, all those people out there think I'm a saint. And when I die, they're going to take their rosaries and their sacramentals and they're going to rub it up against my coffin, thinking that I'm a saint. And the entire time, Bishop, I'm going to be burning on a slab in purgatory. Promise me you'll pray for me when I die. That's what Bernadette said to him. And at that moment, as the story goes, he realized he was in the presence of a saint. Great story. 
So, we should not have a fear of purgatory, although fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But this whole notion that Catholics have, if I can just make it to purgatory, right? I mean, and, and believe me, you may not verbalize that, but every Catholic at some point in time is, if I can just make it to purgatory. No! Jesus does not want that. He does not want that attitude. Strive to enter through the narrow, right? Right? The apostle said, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? Jesus doesn't get into the few, the many, or whatever. He says, look it, just strive to enter through the narrow gate. Don't settle for purgatory. Don't settle for anything other than becoming a saint here on earth and die as a saint. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Right? And I wish I had time to go through that whole thing because that, that actually story is, should be very chilling to Catholics, right? Because what does he say? All right, many, many think they'll be strong enough, they won't be strong enough, they'll be knocking on the door. All right, get away from me, I'm an evildoer, I don't know you. What do you mean you don't know me? We, you, you ate and drank with us, we ate and drank with you, you preached in our streets. What's that an illusion to? The holy sacrifice of the mass. Right, this whole idea that, well, Lord, I mean, we showed up for mass and we listened to you, preach, go away from you. Go away from me, you evildoer. I do not know you. Do not know you. Right? Strive to enter through the narrow gate. That's the whole idea. The three levels of the spiritual life, the lowest level, not doing the will of God. That's it. Intellectual, I accept hell. Doing the will of God. And there's too many Catholics that are in that center spot. Doing the will of God. Checking the box. I do my daily prayers, I go to confession regularly, I go to Mass, right, but we're just checking the box, we're just checking the box, we're checking the box. Our Christian brothers and sisters do have, do have it right that God has a plan for each and every single one of us. And we should be asking our Lord every day, what is your plan for me today? What is your will for me based on my gifts, the grace you have given me? What is your will for me today? Who are you going to entrust in my care today? What more can I do today? That's what Jesus wants. He wants us to be conscious of His will for us each day. In other words, get out of the boat! I need to get out of the boat. I need to get into the storm. I need to trust Jesus. I need to be passionate for Jesus. Alright. So... Three, three parables, three parables about purgatory. And I'm going to go through these real quick. And, you know, you guys, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, I hope, uh, not like a, a regular parish mission. Uh, but the, the rich young man, right? you guys are all familiar with this story. Very, very interesting. The rich young man. So the rich young man approaches Jesus and says, Teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? What must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus says, why are you asking about the good? There's only one who's good, right? If you wish to enter into life, in other words, if you wish to achieve eternal life, keep the commandments. And he asks, which one? Shall not kill, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what's his answer? I, I do all. Right? But see, he understands. See, the, the, this, the, the natural law is written on the hearts of men. He understands that now. Nah, there's got to be more to it than that. Because he asked Jesus, then I, I do all these. What do I still lack? And what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this statement, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. What happened? What happened? What happened there is, first of all, Jesus is making a distinction between eternal salvation and perfection. Right? Nowhere can we imply or assume that this man is not saved. But he's not perfect. But nothing imperfect shall enter into heaven. Jesus wants him to go straight to heaven. 
Live as a saint, die as a saint, go straight to heaven. The man understands it, but he's not ready. So really what our Lord is saying, well, if you wish to be perfect, go perfect yourself in the Beatitudes, right? And you'll have treasure in heaven. That's really another way of saying what Jesus said, right? Go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. They come follow me. But he wasn't ready to be perfect yet. Does that mean he's going to go to hell? No. It means he's, no, nah, I'm going to take my chances with purgatory. Jesus does not want that, right? And then Jesus says, Amen, I say to you, it'll be hard for one who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, it's easy for a, a camel to go through. Now, now the apostles are like mystified, right? They're like, what? Who then can be saved? And Jesus said, for human beings, this is impossible. For God, all things are possible. Now, two levels to that. Right? And, and of course, with God, it's possible through purgatory. Right? That the rich somehow can still be saved. They just need to be purgated. Right? But also, when you think about it, for man, it's impossible. So if we want to detach from all of our wealth, we want to be perfectly poor in spirit. What are we going to do? We're all going to take everything we own, all of our wealth, and dump in the big field? Well, somebody's going to grab it. So for man, in totality, it's impossible for everybody to give up their wealth. But with God, it's still possible to achieve eternal salvation. And there's only one logical answer. It's purgatory. It's purgatory. And Jesus talks about that. He goes through, he says, you know, then Peter says, well, we've given up everything and followed you. What will it be for us? And in essence, Jesus is saying, you're going to go straight to heaven. You're going to go straight to heaven. You're going to die as saints. You're going to live as saints, die as saints. As a matter of fact, you're all going to die for me. Right? That's basically what Jesus says. Anyone who gives up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or land, for my sake, will receive a hundred times more by eternal salvation. And will inherit eternal life. And then Jesus uses the class of purgatory line. Many who first will be last, the last shall be first. And of course, that can only allude to what? This life and the next age, this life and purgatory. There's no first and last in hell. And there's no first and last in, in heaven. In heaven, everybody's perfectly happy to the extent that they can be happy. And everyone's miserable in hell to the extent that they chose misery, right? This reference of first shall be last, the last shall be first can only be, if you choose to be first here, you're going to be last in purgatory. And if you choose to be last here, you're going to be first in purgatory or skip purgatory, be in the front of the line in purgatory, right? Okay. All right, so put that all in your pocket, right? All right, the second one is the wedding feast. Now here we have, we have it all, right? So we have the, the, the kingdom of God can be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. We know what that is. He dispatches servants to summons the invited guests to the feast, but they refuse to come. Second time he goes out, tell them, behold, I've prepared the bank, right? Everything's ready. Blah, 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 blah. Some ignored the invitation, went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murders and burned their cities. What's that all about? You all went to hell. Right? You all, total rejection of God, burned their cities. He sent them all to hell. So then he says, go out therefore into the main roads and invite to the feast whoever you find. Servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found, good and bad alike. And the hall was filled with gifts. Who in a good and bad alike? He invited all the bad, and then he invited all the no, no. The, the good and bad. We're all the good and bad. How many people here today are going to be good and bad? And tomorrow, good and bad. Good and bad. Right? We're all good and bad alike. At the same time. Right? That's why we're in church room. Really. We're in that battle between good and evil. Right? Sometimes we do good. So, so, so he invites everybody, the good and bad alike, into the wedding feast, and the hall was filled. Now, I was on the golf course one day with, with the, my, my 
former spiritual director, not the guy who died, but another one, who recruited me out to the Archdiocese of, of New Mexico, the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. And we're on the golf course, we're on about the 15th hole. And he says, oh, Steve, he says, I'm so excited. He says, this Sunday is the wedding feast, the, the parable of the wedding feast. I love preaching on the, on the wedding feast. And, and he says that, you know, that the guy's not dressed for the feast. And so he gets thrown out. Gets thrown out. Thrown into hell like this, you know. I said, what, what are you saying? He says, well, he wasn't dressed for the feast, so he, he got thrown out. I said, well, that's, that's not why he got thrown out. What? I said, that's not why you got thrown out. Huh? And I always use, I love using the word that Jesus said. What does scripture say? How do you read it? Right? How do you read it? He said, what are you talking about? The king came in to meet the guests. He saw a man there not dressed for the wedding feast. Not dressed in a wedding garment. And he said to him, my friend, my friend, how come you came in here without a wedding garment? My friend, ask a simple question, right? But the man was reduced to silence, right? Arrogant, not going to apologize, not going to ask for a second chance. Hey, how about just give me a chance? I know I made a mistake. I got in here. I saw everybody else is dressed, right? Uh, please give me a chance to go outside and get dressed and change. And, and actually, in the Old Testament, as I understand it, a lot of poor people would be invited to these wedding feasts. They wouldn't be able to afford a new outfit for the wedding feast, but their, their clothes had to be washed clean. To get into the wedding feast, your clothes had to be washed clean. So this guy's clothes were not washed clean. Metaphor for what? You need to be perfect to get into the kingdom of heaven, right? You need to be washed clean. You need to be purgated. Need to be purified, right? But he was reduced to silence. In my mind, he wasn't willing to ask for forgiveness. He wasn't willing to admit that he was wrong. He didn't ask for a second chance. Just, who are you to tell me that I need to be dressed differently than I am? And that's when he said, bind his hands and feet and cast him into the darkness outside where there'll be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. So you have heaven, you have hell. And you have purgatory here, the good and bad alike invited to the feast. They need to be washed clean first. So I can go on and on and on about this parable, but what's the lesson for all of us? When we see Jesus face to face and he confronts us why we're not washed clean, do not remain silent. Do not remain silent. Or do not rationalize your sin, right? I mean, Peter's word, depart from me, Lord, a sinful man. Lord, I I'm sorry. Right? And of course, the mystics talk about purgatory, you know, that, that souls immediately realize they need to be washed clean. All right, so that is allusion to purgatory there. I was doing a theology on tap one night on purgatory, and I used those two parables, and then in the question and answer period, a young man, young guy, I don't think he was 20, he says, hey, Father, because I always wondered about the rich man and Lazarus. I always wondered, is it from purgatory or is it, uh, is it about purgatory or hell? And I said, I don't know. Let's do, let's do a Bible study right now. And I pulled out my Bible and we did a Bible study on the rich man and Lazarus. And I'm convinced it's about purgatory and ain't about hell. All right, real quick. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple garments, fine linen, dying sumptuously. He's rich. All right? Lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. It does not say that he got nothing from the rich man. He just never got his fill. He never got his just due. He never got his fill. But he got something. And not only that, the rich man knew him by name because it's the rich man who names, who calls him by Lazarus first in this parable. When the poor man died, he was carried away by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried and from the netherworld, Hades, where he was in torment. He raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. He cried out, Father Abraham. 
So there's still a relationship. Abraham actually says, my child. So there's still a relationship there. If he was in hell, there'd be no relationship. So, Father Abraham, now this is important, have pity on me. Souls in hell don't understand pity. Have pity on me. But this is a key line. I, I think this is so, when I read this that day, I said, absolutely. Right? Remember, he says, there was a poor man named Lazarus who gladly had eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. So we got some scratch, but never is filled. Notice what the rich man says. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. The man understands justice. The rich man doesn't say, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to quench my thirst. The man knew he didn't deserve to have his thirst quenched. But since he did give Lazarus some scraps, at least he deserved a few drops of water. He understood justice. So he ain't happy. Abraham says, my child, remember when you, you received what was good during your lifetime, Lazarus received uh, what was bad, but now he's comforted here, you're in torment. In other words, you were first, he was last, now he's first, and you're last. That's exactly what Abraham said to this guy. Right? The exact words that Jesus used. And then a lot of people say, well, this next line is why it's proof that he was in hell. Moreover, between us and you is a great chasm established to prevent anyone from crossing, alright, who might wish to go from our side to yours or your side. Well, the bottom line is you're in purgatory. You ain't getting out until you pay the last penny. They know skipping the line, right? There ain't nobody going down. And, you know, there's no Justice needs to be complete. Reparation needs to be done, right? That's it, right? But this is also the clincher then. He says, I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house where I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they too come to this place of torment. Well, that's charity. That's charity. This is the clincher, right? There's no way this guy's in hell because if anything, he'd want his five brothers to join him, right? Because misery loves company. This guy's job would be pr pr prowling the world seeking the root of souls. No, he's in purgatory. Don't you think that every one of our loved ones are in purgatory? And of course, the great mystics have experienced this, right? The souls in purgatory coming back to warn them. Warn them, we don't want to go here. Don't you think all of our loved ones would love to come back and say, Hey, listen, do it now. Do it now. We don't want to endure this. Do it now. So that's charity. And of course, Abraham says, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But that's what the, the rich man says, and Abraham had to laugh at that one, right? Right? That's our Christian brothers and sisters. Jesus rose from the dead. All of them, you gotta repent. If you will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will be persuaded that someone should rise from the dead. And I think that's the clincher in terms of the fact that, look it, you know, be diligent, be awake. Purgatory is real. It's real. And it's very logical. So devotion to souls in purgatory, especially those that have no one to pray for them. So I'm going to get into the controversial part of all this. All right? Now, a Christian brother said, I came up with this modern day power that illustrates the foolishness of the Christian non-Catholic view of just heaven and hell versus the logic of Catholics' idea of purgatory. So there's a man, he's married, beats his wife, abuses his wife, goes on for a few years, they have a couple of kids, he abuses the kids, molests the kids, he's just, he's horrible, right? So for years he's abusing his wife, cheating on his wife, abusing his kids, and finally one day, 
uh, he meets this young girl and he takes up with the young girl, he takes off, and he leaves his wife and two children destitute. Takes all the money, they lose the house, they're out on the streets, the wife and the two kids are out on the streets, they're begging, borrowing, stealing, doing anything they can while this guy is living high on the heart with his new girlfriend, all right? They're, they're gallivanting around, right? This goes on for quite a while, all right? And of course, the, the, the woman, you know, somebody had said that, hey, trust in Jesus, she'd say, trust in Jesus? What kind of God would perpetrate this on, on me and my, my children? Who would do this? While, while this guy is off gallivanting around with his young girlfriend, leaving us destitute, right? Invincible ignorance? Or invincible ignorance? Well, anyway, one day, it's going on for a few years, and one day, this guy, this guy, is with his girlfriend, and he says, hey, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to buy some booze for tonight, I'll be right back, and he drives into town on his way back, he sees this revival tent, and he stops the car, and he hears this preacher preaching, and there's an altar call, and he, he goes in, and he answers the altar call. And he proclaims Jesus on his lips and believes that Jesus is Lord and Savior. It's a sincere conversion. He really has a conversion of heart. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my girlfriend it's over. And I'm going to go find my wife and kids and I'm going to do reparation. I'm going to make it up to them. I'm going to do right for the rest of my life. I'm saved and I'm, and I'm going to do the right thing. Well, on the way back to telling his girlfriend all this, he gets hit head on by a tractor trail and he dies. That same night his wife and two kids die from exposure to the cold, to the elements. And they all go up and of course they all meet Peter at the pearly gates. No, they meet Jesus, right? Our Christian brothers and sisters would have us believe, based on their theology, that this guy who proclaimed Jesus as his Lord and Savior would enter into heaven and that the wife and the two kids who did not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, never proclaimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, go to heaven. That's what, based on what I understand their theology, that's what they would claim. And actually, I presented this to a couple of evangelicals and said, well, it is what it is. No, it ain't. Alright, but Jesus is not just and Jesus is not merciful. So what would be the Catholic viewpoint? The Catholic viewpoint would be that if this man had a true conversion, he would say to Jesus, Jesus, listen, when we were on earth, they were last. I put them last. I put myself first. And you know what? If you're, if you're willing to allow me to be saved, let me be purgated. Let me do their punishment. Let me... You know, you put them ahead of me. Let them go first. I'll suffer for them because I made them suffer during this earth. Right? The first shall be last. The last shall be first. In other words, the Catholic viewpoint would be they all have an opportunity for eternal salvation. And that the man would willingly put his wife and children before him. They'd still have to do some purgation as a proof that purgatory exists. The proof that Jesus is all just and all merciful. Right? But they'd all get to heaven, but they would go first and he would go last. And that's far more logical. Any rational person would say, okay, that makes sense. Not the other thing, the other thing doesn't make any sense at all. And I've had some Christian brothers say, well, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. I said, well, that's what Catholics do. That's what Catholics do. That's what tantamount to a Catholic do. So my friend Frank, my brother Frank, and my friend Frank left the Catholic faith at the same time. And I went through this two years of saying, what was the attraction of being a Baptist or, you know, an evangelical? And, and I, it's, look, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's it's an easy path to heaven, right? I mean, that's, you know, let's face it, we're saved, we're saved, that's it. We're done, nothing more, right? And I came to the realization, it's, it's just goofy, it's just goofy stuff. Studied their, their, their theology for two years and, you know... It was just, it was just goofy. But anyway, after it was all over, I met with my friend Frank, who was teaching religious ed, left religious ed, left the Catholic faith to become evangelical. And for about two hours, I remember we sat in the park one night after I'd done two, two years of apologetic study. 
And uh, I refuted every one of his arguments, scripturally, every one of his arguments. And he says to me at the very end, he says, so do you think that I'm not safe? That's what he says to me. And I said, you know, Frank, I said, you're holier than me. You're holier than me. I said, I should be as holy as you. But here's what I did. I said, Frank, if we both die tonight, I believe we both end up in purgatory. I said, but here's the reality of purgatory. See, now that you converted to evangelicalism, maybe even before, you don't know anyone other than me who's going to pray for you once you're in purgatory because they don't believe in purgatory. So they're not going to pray for you. They're going to have nobody praying for you. I said, not only that, you're not doing any reparation for your sins because you don't feel you have to do reparation. So as much as I'm a bigger sinner than you, I'm doing reparation every day for my sins. And if I die, I got a lot of people to be praying for me while I'm in purgatory. I said, so what's going to happen in spite of the fact that you're living a better life than me, you're probably going to end up realizing you're going to spend far more time in purgatory than me. Because you have nobody praying for you, and you didn't do any reparation for your sins while I did. But then, Frank, the clincher is going to hit you. Because you're going to realize that the only way you're going to get out of purgatory is them rascally Catholics who are praying for the souls in purgatory, especially those that have no one to pray for them like you. And you can see the light bulb and all. I said, it's them rascally Catholics going to get you away from purgatory. I said, I know and I'm convinced that that's what most likely would happen. Right? And then it came to me, how can we say, because this is a big theological question, right, Michael? There's no salvation outside the church. All right, I believe that. There's no salvation outside the church. But how, in a practical sense, does that happen? Well, how about this? Nobody experiences eternal salvation outside of the church. And that people who die outside of the church who are on a sincere journey for the truth, as St. John Paul II talks about, right? And ben, I mean, and Francis on a sincere, a sincere, heartfelt journey for the truth. Die, see the truth. I, I believe that the overwhelming majority of people in purgatory are in purgatory as a proof of its existence. Because I really believe that if you die and you see Jesus face to face and you realize the injustice and the mercy and everything else, that you're going to have to experience some purgatory as a proof of purgatory's existence. As a proof that, is, that he is all just and all merciful. And that very possibly the overwhelming majority of souls in purgatory are there as a proof of the existence of Christ being all just and all merciful through purgatory. And how are they going to get out of purgatory? All the Catholics that are praying their way through purgatory, for all the souls who are in purgatory, but no one praying for them. And thus, there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, because it's the Catholic Church that's moving all of these people through purgatory to finally experience eternal salvation. Now, my right eye, no idea, but it's as good an explanation as any I've heard, right? But it all centers around purgatory. It's such a great gift from God. It really, really is. And so we want to do our purgatory here and now by uniting everything we do every day to Christ on the cross, trying to live as sacrificial a life as we can. But definitely uniting ourselves to Christ on the cross and our evangelical brothers and sisters are absolutely wrong when they say our works have no merit because everything united to Christ on the cross has merit. Every prayer, every work of mercy, every man, everything united to Christ. That's why the daily offering every morning, morning offering every day, when you offer up your entire day to Jesus, united to Jesus on the cross and ask Him to shed His mercy, His grace on you, 
This is what the Liturgy of the Hours is all about. The church prays ceaselessly. This is how we turn our life into a prayer by uniting to Christ on the cross. Do our reparation now, sacrificial living now. Taking care of the least of Christ, brethren, now, putting other people first before us now. Because Jesus does not want us even spending a day in purgatory. A day in purgatory is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. The great story of the of the nun. Right? Showed up to Sister Gertrude. And said, Sister, you gotta get the nuns praying more, offering up more masses. I, I can't take a I can't take another day in purgatory. I can't take another day. It's, I've been there forever. And, and Sister Ger, Sister Ger, St. Gertrude says, but Sister, we just buried you this morning. Right? I mean, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. And it makes perfect sense. I had Dr. Donald DeMarco in a, in a uh, philosophy of death class in the seminary where he says, look it. He says, touch your finger. And you'll realize how slow, much slower time goes. Right? Stub your tongue. Time automatically slows up. When you're in pain, time goes slow. So it makes perfect sense. A day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. Do it now. Do reparation now. And develop the devotion for the souls in purgatory. They are the poor, the sick, the thirsty, the naked, the homeless, the hungry, the prison, right? Or at least the equivalent of. And so we have a devotion to the souls of birth, especially those that have no one to pray for them. Very possible when we die and see Jesus face to face, maybe we won't have an ace to final exam, but we'll have a lot of friends saying, yeah, cut him a break. How about a curve, Jesus? How about a curve for them? Right? All right. Amen? Amen. All right. So we have five minutes. Uh, at 2.30, I'll answer some questions. Let me see if I... I don't think I missed anything. But I went through it really, really quickly. All right. So, I'm not going to hold the, the relic here. You to venerate. You can self-venerate. Either touch it or whatever. But this is... Uh, St. Francis, all right, we're going to go get ready to expose our Lord, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll start the Holy Hour at about 2.30. I'll come back, and I'll ask if there's any questions. If there's no questions, then I'm not going to take any questions. And this is the questions where, you know, you just raise your hand, I fall on you, and ask a spiritual direction question, right? Something that has to do with, uh, hopefully, something we discussed. I don't, I don't want to answer why are the bishops 